Hey. <laughs> yes, thank you. Your cake looked amazing, by the way, Val. <laughs> really good. So welcome everyone to a conversation with, and I'm delighted that we've got Rosanna Miles with us today, um, who has been over the last year, I think, has been working on the Dementia Adventure podcasts. Um, my name is Emma Smith. I am the project manager with Empowered Conversations. If you've not come across us, we deliver communication courses across Greater Manchester for family carers and also for professionals and really sort of drilling into communication and connection and thinking how we can connect differently with people living with dementia. Um, alongside that, we offer one-to-one -one support in Salford through Empowered Carers. And as a result of COVID, we have been doing things like this. So this is our 21st um, webinar. <laughs> and we've also been running carers groups, a weekly disco, a singing group, drawing group. We've been visiting a farm you name it, we've been, we've been having a go at that. So the format for today, for anyone that's not been on, on, on a Zoom seminar before, you shouldn't see yourself. So sorry if you spent time on your makeup today, you should only see myself and Rosanna. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat function um, and some of you have used that already. Next to that is something called a Q&A. So if you have any questions, rather than write them down, you might wanna just drop them in into that box. And what we'll do is after Rosanna's presentation, we'll go into the Q&A and we'll, and we'll pick them up from there, if that's okay with everyone. All right then, Rosanna, I think I'm gonna hand over to you if that's okay. Lovely, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming and meeting me today. I'm so pleased to get to talk to you about the Dementia Adventure podcast of which I am producer, creator and also presenter. And I think the most succinct way to introduce you to the podcast is to play you our weekly introduction to it. Now I'm sharing my sound on my laptop to your device. When you listen to the podcast through your own device or earphones, I'm sure the sound will be even nicer and clearer, but hopefully this will be good enough to give you a taster and pique your interest. So having been beautifully introduced by Emma, for good measure, you're now going to hear me introduce myself again and introduce the Dementia Adventure. So here we go. And this is the Dementia Adventure. This podcast is for anyone whose life is being touched by dementia. I'll be talking to experts of all kinds, people experiencing dementia, research scientists, family carers, support workers, therapists, even a Buddhist monk. Navigating the world of dementia can feel overwhelming. So this podcast is full of tips, advice, thoughts, support, love, and shared experience. We're traveling hand in hand with the wonderful people at Alzheimer's Research UK and their Inspire Fund. And we're delighted that you're joining us as we set off on our dementia adventure. So um, I hope everyone could hear that. Please just put in the chat if you can't and we'll have a look as to why. Hopefully we can kick off. So I decided to create this podcast, The Dementia Adventure, for a couple of reasons. Um, I was lucky enough that all my grandparents lived well into their 90s, but all of them developed dementia in the latter years of their life. Their dementias presented very differently because dementias are unique in the same way that our personalities are unique. Um, but dementia was very present in my life as a child and certainly in my teenage years. And my parents were amazing and looked after them brilliantly and loved them brilliantly. But it was very present in our family. And then a few years ago, my dad received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia. And he received his diagnosis much earlier in life. He's actually only 78 now. So I thought at that point I would like to find out as much as I can about dementia to um, essentially be as good a daughter as I can be to him and maintain as good a relationship as I can with the dad whom I adore. And I think there are so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about dementia and I think there's also 
better ways that we can start to think about it. And what I mean by that is if we think about, for example, how we as a society now think about something like mental health issues, we have, thank God, moved on hugely. Uh, we no longer think of somebody as mad or crazy, but we greet that understanding of a mental health need with empathy, with scientific understanding, and we expect a person who has mental health needs to have as happier and as fulfilled and as purposeful life as they possibly can. And I think that's how we need to start thinking about dementia too. Um, and we need to respond to dementia in that same way of raising our expectations for our friends, our colleagues, our loved ones. And so I wanted to try and expand my mind, think outside the box. And also I think it's a universal truth that we just don't know what we don't know. Um, so as I've already explained, my family had quite a lot of experience of dementia. And my mum, by the way, is medical. She's a cardiographer and so has a huge understanding of human biology. In fact, she knows a lot of things about a lot of things, really. And yet when she and dad uh, were told that he had Alzheimer's, she was really shaken. She was shocked. And she said, you know, I was prepared for the fact that he might have dementia, but I never thought they'd say the word Alzheimer's to me. That is so much worse. Of course, we now know it's one of the same, one of the same thing. Dementia is the word used to describe the symptoms which are caused by changes in the brain. And the changes in the brain are usually caused by brain diseases, the most common of which being Alzheimer's. There's also vascular dementia, Parkinson's related dementia, head injuries can cause dementia. But so knowledge wise, we really fell at the first hurdle there. And actually that lack of knowledge caused probably even more anxiety and distress to my mom and probably my dad too, than it would have done simply through a misunderstanding of the word Alzheimer's. So I sent a proposal to Alzheimer's Research UK and was awarded their Inspire Fund, which is an amazing drive to engage people, to bust myths, to get people talking, crying or laughing about dementia and Alzheimer's Research UK have been hugely supportive and they're even guests on the podcast so I'm very grateful to them and it's been my absolute privilege to interview and to chat to 10 very different people from all walks of life about dementia as you heard in the introduction there's brain scientists there's family carers, support workers, people with dementia, and they're sharing their expertise and often sharing really personal stories. Um, so I really think that there's something within the Dementia Adventure series, which is currently in series one, 10 half hour episodes. I think there's something for everyone, be it practical advice or positive tips that you can try at home or whether it's simply the comfort of thinking, yeah, that's how I feel. So today I would like to share with you some of my personal highlights and then leave you to enjoy the rest of the series in your own time. Um, so I'm going to share different clips from different episodes. There's Obviously, unfortunately, it's audio, so I'm sorry there's nothing visual for you to look at. So feel free to close your eyes as you listen to the clips or look out the window. In fact, I might suggest that you close your eyes because we're going to be tuning into quite a few voices and accent wise, we're going to traverse the British Isles. We start in Scotland and we're going to Birmingham, London, back up towards Manchester again. Um, and when you listen to the podcast, of course, 
do so in whatever way suits you, whether you're doing the washing up or going for a walk or having a bath. I really want the podcast to be um, a support for you in whatever way you need it as and when you need it. So the first clip is, it's the longest that I'm going to play you. This clip is three minutes because it is so rich with information and thoughts from Barbara Horn, who is a speech and language therapist for the NHS. She actually calls herself a communication specialist. And she works with people who've had a stroke, who've had acquired brain injury, and of course, people with dementia. So, um, what she talks about here is equally applicable for people who've had strokes as well. So this is Barbara Horn. Oh, I should say, I ask a question at the beginning of this and I'm not particularly articulate. I ask, um, what changes do you see in communication in people with dementia? So here we are, this is Barbara Horn. What are the changes might we expect to see in communication in the person with dementia? Uh, their reasoning skills change, their ability to make decisions, make judgments, their ability to initiate, uh, to start conversations, to have new ideas, their vocabulary is reduced, they have difficulties naming things and finding words, they overuse certain phrases, so you hear the same thing again and again and again, and families will often excuse that in an older person as, oh, they're just getting on a bit, or, well, granny's forgetful. One of the messages that I would like to be taken away from this podcast is if you start seeing changes in communication like that, they are often the first sign that something is going wrong. Have it investigated. Go to your GP. Ask for a referral to a speech and language therapist. Access a memory clinic because things can be done to help. Yes, interesting. It feels very poignant what you're saying. My father, who has Alzheimer's dementia, it's his communication that I think is the most affected currently and the thing that we noticed first. And I think there's a real lack of understanding, perhaps, that Alzheimer's especially we think of as a loss of memory as a forgetting of people around them. And actually that's not been my experience at all. And so I've found very little comfort in what's out there about Alzheimer's because actually it's about his communication. Sometimes it's a loss of words, but it's interesting what you're saying about starting conversations or taking in information, bringing it out because he's a hugely bright man, my father, and it's all still there. And I find it very sad because in now a social context, we don't see it. And I'm sure that, it's us, it's the people around him that aren't coping with that well, because it's there, we're just not facilitating his communication. And that was a big change in, in my 20 years of being a speech and language therapist that um, interested me in stroke, because we started using the social model of disability, which is exactly what you're talking about, which is rather than treat the person with the stroke and get them to talk properly, yes, they change the environment. And I think that can be applied to the person with dementia. You're absolutely right. And that if we can identify what is happening to that person, if we can then help the people who are living with the person with dementia to understand, even on a very basic level, what's happening in the brain and what is going to happen in the brain. A dementia is an umbrella term for a lot of disorders, but they are progressive neurological disorders. They go in one direction. You're not going to regain speech. I'm not going to improve the speech of the person with dementia, but I can reduce frustration and help both the person with dementia and the people that they're living with to have the best quality of conversations and communication that is possible over the years that they have left. Barbara references there the social model of disability and that responsibility on all of us to create an environment wherein all of us can thrive, whether we have dementia or not, is really fascinating to me. And if you listen to episode three of the podcast, which is many people's favourite, actually, because it's really calming, you will meet um, a man called Bryn Jones, who is a fascinating and wonderful man. He's a uh, drama and movement therapist. He's also a mindfulness 
based psychotherapist and he used to be a Buddhist monk but he we discovered women actually he fell in love and got married so he gave that up um, but he has this wonderful way of looking at the world and he says in his episode that we're all affected by we're all involved in this thing called dementia but we compartmentalize it in one person but on some level we've all got it we've just got different bits of it and what I find really uplifting about that is we are all affected by it and so let's all be part of the resolution or the revolution to improve this thing called dementia. So going back to episode one now, Barbara continues in the podcast to explain really practical and positive things that we can do to improve and facilitate communication between someone experiencing dementia and their friends and their family. Um, she talks about something called reality orientation, which helps uh, somebody with dementia feel secure and safe. She talks about reminiscence therapy, which is the use of memories as an aid or a basis to conversation. And she suggests that perhaps you can make a memory book or a folder of someone's life and use that with them or the use of music to aid memories. And she talks about resolution therapy. Now that's something that may come into play in the latter years of someone with dementia, it may not, but it's about um, that the words themselves that somebody uses are less important than the meaning that those words convey. So for example, somebody may say, I want my mummy, I want my mummy. Now, of course, the likelihood is that their mother may have passed away many years previously. What's important about what they're saying is what we can hopefully gather from the words, I want my mummy, is that that person might be saying, I want to feel safe, I want to feel loved, I want my mummy, I, I, want, I want security. And so rather than saying, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, your mummy's not here, we can say, you seem to be distressed, can I help you? Or perhaps we don't say anything, perhaps we just hold their hand or stroke their hair. And I'm going to play you one more clip of, of Barbara uh, explaining validation therapy, because I think validation therapy is something that we can probably all use with somebody as soon as tomorrow. Um, so this is Barbara again from episode one. Here we go. Validation therapy is something else that I use. I use it with acquired brain injury. It is where you go where the person with dementia is going in conversation. You might be having a conversation with them about what they want for lunch. And in the middle of all, they suddenly go off about a beach or um, an elephant. And it has absolutely nothing to do with, on the surface, what you were talking about. In validation therapy, what we try to help people to understand is they are telling you something. And there is a school of thought that people with dementia can only function in their deep subconscious and that we can delve down there with them to have a conversation by just following them and where they go. So, so you were talking about an elephant and you are with your tone of voice and your facial expression and also you're reflecting back the words that you are understanding. You are moving down into that subconscious, deep subconscious layer and you just keep going until what I find with acquired brain injury often not always but often it's like a light switch and you think I know what you're talking about <laughs> and you are having a meaningful conversation I really take to validation therapy I think it allows us the option of rather than denying a reality or a point of view of someone who's experiencing dementia, perhaps we can explore this new reality with them and therefore have a, a more enjoyable time with them. 
And Kate Russell Smith talks very eloquently about this in episode five of The Dementia Adventure. Her dad has Parkinson's related dementia, so he sometimes hallucinates things. And she was chatting to him in his lounge one day and he said, can you see the little red door in the, in the skirting board? And instead of saying, no, dad, there isn't a little red door, she said, oh, what does it look like? What's through the little red door? And suddenly he lit up and he was more illuminated in his conversation and himself uh, that she, than she had seen in a really long time. And she had a really lovely chat with him and he had a really lovely chat with her and she left feeling much happier than she usually did. And, and I hope he was left feeling happy and, and less isolated too. And Peter Berry, who experiences dementia and is my guest in episode 10, he says that some little white lies are okay. He says that dementia is a really complex condition, but with sometimes very simple solutions, simple answers. And sometimes the answer is to agree and just go with that person on their journey. Now, Kate and Barbara both acknowledge in their podcasts, episodes, they go on to acknowledge that it is easy to sit here and say this. It is easy for me to sit here and talk like this. I'm not living with somebody who has dementia every day. And sometimes you don't have the energy to go through the little red door with them. Sometimes you just don't have the time to talk about the elephant. You really do need to know what they want for lunch, a soup or a sandwich. Sometimes, as Kate says in episode five, you don't have the bandwidth. And that is totally understandable. And so if, if you're listening to me right now and feeling a bit like that, that is 100% valid. And there are episodes within the Dementia Adventure that address this too. And I'd like to play you two clips now, actually, that are about the importance of self-care for carers especially during the time of lockdown, my gosh. Um, first, you'll hear from Mandy, who is a support worker for family carers, and her episode is episode four of The Dementia Adventure. And then we're going to skip to episode nine, where you're going to hear James. And James is the husband of a wife with early onset dementia. And he talks about the importance of admiral nurses in supporting carers as well as experiences. So first up is Mandy. Mandy, is there a particular piece of advice that you find yourself saying a lot when you meet carers that you might be able to impart to our listeners who may be carers or be becoming carers at the moment? Yeah, yeah, talk, talk, talk. talk. Honestly, it is so important for the carers not to be frightened to say that they're scared you know how they're feeling emotionally just express what what their worst fear is because they always think they're on their own but every carer has that same emotion they could express it differently but it comes from the same place yeah. talk, talk and just don't be frightened to express yourself and to also take time for yourself even if it's 10 minutes a day go into another room go for a walk do something for yourself because it that you need it. It is vital. They're the two. Taking that time out and talking. It sounds like you and Maria have incredible friends to reach out to, but we've also talked about the importance of Admiral Nurses for you. Can you tell me about Admiral Nurses? Yeah, with pleasure. First of all, Admiral Nurses, the analogy that I've made is with Macmillan Cancer Nurses. Admiral Nurses are trained nurses with all the sort of clinical and communication skills that that implies, and they specialise in looking after not only people who have the condition, but people who are affected around and supporting families and friends and lovers who are affected by their loved one having the condition. In terms of my own personal experience, I think our Admiral Nurse, Maggie Carroll, was the difference between us being in total crisis and meltdown and 
with us actually finding a way through that, what a lot of people who are going through this find is that a lot of the support and services can sometimes feel very fragmented, at worst, sort of piecemeal, and it can be very difficult to navigate. And I think an Admiral nurse can actually help navigate some of those services on a practical level. And on a personal level, I mean, my experience of Admiral nurses is just inspiring people and they're compassionate. And I know that when Maria and I had a meeting with, with Maggie, we'd feel better that she helped us navigate key services. So, yeah, it's absolutely vital. There aren't enough of them. For example, I think the Macmillan Cancer Nurse template is really inspiring, provides a really inspiring example of what can be done. But there are, for example, 3,500 Macmillan Cancer Nurses. And I think at the end of last year, there were just over 300 Admiral Nurses. And I feel lucky. I, I live in North London. I live on one side of Finsbury Park in a particular borough where there is an Admiral Nurse, where there's funding for an Admiral Nurse. If I lived on the other side of... Finsbury Park, I would have been in a borough without an Admiral Nurse. And one of the things that I hope is that provision becomes much more widespread and universal. It's not just a matter of luck of where you live. Your Admiral Nurse has obviously been an absolute lifeline for you and Maria, and everybody needs that and deserves that. If you want to look up whether there is an Admiral Nurse near you, just visit dementiauk.org which is a fantastic charity that helped to fund Admiral Nurses. And they've got two brilliant videos on their site which explain all about Admiral Nurses, how they can help you, what they can do. There's also an Admiral Nurse hotline, which you can telephone, which is 0800 888 6678 or email helpline at dementiauk.org. So there are elements of the podcast which are a bit of a call to action, as well as support and advice. There is a call to action. There's a call to action on ourselves to better facilitate people living within the world of dementia, whether they're experiencing dementia or caring for somebody who is. There's a call to action on a societal level in terms of professional carers, care homes, dementia friendly restaurants what they might look like and of course there's a call to action of what we need to achieve scientifically and the latter or the last two points there really need funding Um, and I'm probably preaching to the converted because you all are all aware of the wonderful work that Age UK Salford do and support them but it is worth saying that Mandy, who you heard, who did episode four for me, since we recorded that podcast together, the local borough council withdrew their funding of a support group that had been going for, it was 18 years. And so Mandy can no longer support the family carers in Birmingham and she's heartbroken about it. And now, of course, we're in a global pandemic and we are I think heading probably for a financial crisis if we're not there already. And I think things like age and dementia are going to be shunted down the list of financial support for us personally when we give to charities, but also on on a national level. So I'd like to share another couple of clips with you so that you can advocate to others why it is so vital to put money into dementia charities and dementia research and care for the elderly now because it will save our country money in the long run. Um, So the first voice you're going to hear is Dr Amy Monaghan who is a drug researcher for dementia and the second voice you'll hear is Katie who is a public engagement officer for Alzheimer's Research UK and her episode is number eight. This is Amy first, Dr Monaghan, she's episode two. There's a statistic that if we delay the onset of dementia by two years, then we will save about 12.9 billion a year on the NHS. Right now, we estimate dementia costs the economy over £26 billion a year, which is huge. 
And that cost is made up of a number of things. Um, and because the treatment options for dementia right now are relatively limited, it's not really an NHS medicine cost. It's more of informal carers. It's the formal care of people having to be put in care facilities or have carers come into their home. It's the changes to people's lives they make, changing their hours to look after a loved one with dementia. And that is the economic impact of that. And we've done loads of economic modelling over the years that shows if we had effective treatments that could slow down the rate at which somebody might progress once they've got a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or another dementia, that overall cost would be reduced because we're keeping them out of a care home. You know, they're, they're living independently. There's probably more of an upfront cost in terms of the medicines that they're being given. But in the long run, there is a saving. And so that's, yeah, I guess the real economic reasoning and the, the evidence behind that. There's also, I guess, the, the human side of it, that actually we want people to live independently, to enjoy the later years of their lives as, as they deserve to. And so if we can keep them independent and make those medicines that do that, then again, they're not having many years in, in care homes or in difficult situations. So if we can invest the money now, do the research, understand how to stop people developing dementia and develop the treatments that we can give them if they do, that's what we need to see. And that requires investment now. So I hope you're getting a sense from these clips of just how many topics the Dementia Adventure addresses and from how many angles we come at dementia and from how many ways we explore dementia. I don't experience dementia myself currently and I think the way I have pitched this presentation is as if you don't currently um, experience dementia but you may be listening to this experiencing dementia and if so thank you so much for listening to me talk about it and I think it's really important to give the last words to the dementia experiences who have been so fantastic and added so much to this podcast series. So the voices you're about to hear are, well they're from my two favourite episodes actually, you're about to hear the indomitable uh, Sue Strawn who has vascular dementia and she is a guest in episode seven. And then you're going to hear Peter Berry, who has Alzheimer's dementia. He is a raconteur. And his episode is out on Monday and also features his dear friend, Deb Bunt, who is also the author of his fantastic book. I finally have a visual for you called The uh, Slow Puncture, Living Well with Dementia. And this is a fantastic book um, that can be ordered wherever you order your books. Um, so yes, I, it's my huge pleasure to now introduce you to Sue, Peter and Deb. I understand that there will be a lot of people listening to this who have a loved one or a friend or a neighbour who is much further down their journey of dementia and they might find it rather patronising or even upsetting that I am so positive about this. But I want to say that I absolutely understand how devastating this vile disease is. And my future is not great, but I'm trying to live in the now and I'm trying to make positive steps now. What's the overriding thing that someone should take away from this podcast? I'm still me, the person living with dementia and their loved ones, because we talk about people living with dementia. You live with dementia because of your father's diagnosis. It isn't just the person, but, but for me, I am still me, if that's helpful. Don't let me go. I think I've come to realise that it is possible to live well with it in our age group. Well, I think in any age group. How have you learned to live well with it? I, really, I think I just learned to take every day as it comes and not, not worry about the things I can't do, but concentrate on the things I can do. And I think not to get put off if I find things difficult. Just keep plugging away at it. It takes me longer to do things, but I suppose 
because I don't work anymore, I've got more time to do them. So it really doesn't really matter that much. And I love that you call it your dementia monster. And you've even sort of drawn him, haven't you? How does that help separating your dementia as a monster? Well, I think for me personally, I had to make my dementia a thing. I had to make it something that, that was real, that wasn't inside me. I had to somehow make it an item that, that I could visualise. So I have this idea of me sitting at home and my monster is sitting there on the settee next to me, um, rather grumpy. And um, he's, he's quite pleased, really, that, that I'm at home and he's in control. And then when I get on my bike, I go out and I think that I've left him at home. So he's there on his own and I come back when I want to. He's, he's not in control anymore. It's up to me. So I'm the one that then controls it. Then when I come back, I can actually live with him better because I've done something that I want. And I can imagine him sitting there thinking, oh, well, you're back then. What time do you call this? <laughs> <laughs> Just because Peter has dementia doesn't mean he can't do all those things really well. I have no hesitation in saying, Peter, I've got a problem in my bike because I know he'll fix it. He might not find my house straight away, but he will fix my bike and he's still... Peter, and, and that's the essence of who you are. Well, you will keep moving your house, that's the thing. One day is one place, the next day is somewhere else. I don't know what you do. Keep, keep you on your toes. Isn't it? In their novel, Slow Puncture, Peter says, I came to the conclusion that dementia was not the thing which robbed us of our dignity, but it was the reactions of others which did. Thank you so much for listening to me and listening to the clips from the Dementia Adventure podcast. I should say that you can listen to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. So we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you just write in the Dementia Adventure and we will pop straight up. I've tried to be quite explicit when I've named each episode so that you can think, oh yeah I think that will be useful to listen to that one today or no I'm gonna I'm gonna leave listening to that one for a couple of weeks actually um, or of course I hope that you may listen to one or read a title and think that might be useful for so and so to hear and please do pass them on or it might be a way of aiding your communication with people if you send one to a friend and say could you listen to this this is this is what I'm going through right now um, so we need to keep this conversation up and break the taboo that is dementia and uh, to continue the conversation I'm thrilled to say that having spoken now to these extraordinary humans and um, being given a window into their life, uh, Alzheimer's Research UK are backing myself and two professional writers, Kate Russell Smith and Simon Snashel, to create a brand new play about dementia, which is called Oranges and Oranges. So once you've listened to all the podcast and you're hungry for more next year or maybe the year after, look out for Oranges and Oranges by Kate Russell Smith and Simon Snashel. And I'm Rosanna Miles, and thank you so much for coming and meeting me today. And I'll hand back to Emma. Oh, Rosanna, that was so good to listen to the podcast. I did what you told me to do, and I looked out the window, I looked up at the blue sky so I could really focus in on their voices. And I think collectively we should be massively grateful for you to having recorded this material and just put it out there for us all to benefit from. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> So it's over to you all now. You've been very, you've been very good. You've been very quiet. So um, we have done a few comments. Oh, Francis, well done, Rosanna. We shall definitely now listen to all the podcasts. Francis, why have you not listened to them up until now? <laughs> oh, she's saving it. <laughs> all right. So Thank I'm you. Going to, <laughs> I'm going to uh, point you down to the Q and A now. So if you have any questions, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q and A. Um, that would be really good. And um, I was sat there listening, Rosanna, and I, I feel. Oh, Jane has said thank you so much. What I've heard res resonates with my experiences and approaches. 
Jane, you've taken the words out of my out of my mouth. I was going to say it really validates um, the Empowered Conversations course because as you had those different interviews, I was like, yep, yeah, that's our approach. And yes, we include that. And yes, we would talk about that. So um, <laughs> we're not alone. Definitely not alone, Jane. Um, so thank you so much for that. Right, over to the Q&A now, people, if you will. Um, it's just easier to manage if you're in there. Um, but... Trevor did make a comment while, while you were talking. He said, as my wife's ability to communicate regressed in line with her advancing Alzheimer's, I found that the art of conversation hinged increasingly on my ability to have a one-way dialogue with her, which necessitated nothing more than the odd simple yes or no from her. So almost taking the pressure off for Trevor, not, not putting under any pressure to answer a question. You were sort of providing the, the conversation and then allowing your wife just to say a yes or a no and join in when she felt comfortable. So we use it's a lot of effort though that doesn't it that's you know <laughs> tiring it's tiring fun. yeah it's very tiring it is mm. uh, okay do this oh francis has asked do the services available vary between regions yeah I, from my understanding yes i think actually emma will be much better um at responding to this I, I think that's one of the things i found quite interesting actually feedback wise about um, the podcast. For instance, I played you a lot from episode one with Barbara Horn, who's talking about communication. And she sort of said, you know, go find, ask to speak to a, a speech and language therapist. Well, actually, the first time my mum did, she didn't have a lot of um, comeback on that at all. She has, because she's very per perseveres. Um, she has now communicated with somebody who's great and has been helpful, but it is really difficult. And I do think, um, yeah, services and certainly things like these admiral nurses, as James said, you know, depending which side of the park he was on, it is a postcode lottery, you know, we hear that a lot, but there is that, isn't there, Emma, I think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even just within Greater Manchester, so that's our area, you know, Salford really is sort of, people all go, oh, you live in Salford, oh, you know, that's not, we've, we've got so many services and so much happening in Salford, and then we might go over to another area, we might go over to, say, Oldham and it just wouldn't be happening at quite that same level so even within quite a you know we're, we are a big conurbation but we've got definitely we've got differences uh, of service available and yeah it feels very unfair doesn't it so one of our biggest problems um with empowered conversations is we might be working in a certain area and we want to offer them more and we just don't have the money in that area to offer them more so yeah it's it is it's a tricky one Francis Anonymous, adventure, adventure in Essex is 11 year old. Are you the same out? Oh, is 11 years old. Are you the same outfit? Oh, yes. Now, Emma was telling me about this. I'm going to have to invite these wonderful people on, see if they'll do an episode for me. So, no, there is um, a group called the Dementia Adventure who sound fantastic. Emma was telling me about it just before you all joined that organize holidays for people who experience dementia and right aren't I Emma and they're actually really active holidays and a lot of the drive on that is to be really active and to be I really good fun and a little bit well very adventurous I suppose so no I chose to call it the dementia adventure um, for many reasons really you have to be very brave to go on an adventure <laughs> and parts of an adventure you have to stop someone else falling off the cliff as you go um, and also I'm not going to lie it's because it goes well with the word dementia uh, <laughs> if dementia was called bottle I might have called it bottle throttle um, but, um, yeah so we're not linked to that amazing group um, who have been really really kind at not sort of saying oi can we have our name back? Um, we are the Dementia Adventure podcast, but I think we will definitely ask them to be guests. <laughs> I think that would be a good next step. So while I'm waiting for some more questions, so you said, you know, we've, you've done 10 podcasts now. Have, have we come to an end with the podcasts? What's next? So the end has come for series one. And I think what I'd like to do going forward, so I'm balancing this with working and, and doing everything else. Um, so there'll be a little break now while people catch up on this. As you said, there's a lot there to listen to. Um, and I've had an idea that for series two, I might make much sm 
shorter episodes make sort of bite-sized episodes but which apparently there is quite an appetite for just in the podcast world at the moment anyway um because you can I'm not that we're really commuting during lockdown but you can listen on a bit of a walk as you go get the paper or whatever and also I thought if you're experiencing dementia maybe sm- shorter podcasts are better so I would love um and some people have come forward um and suggested people or themselves or things but to sort of tackle an issue like somebody might have a story that they could share that helps other people at time of diagnosis or somebody else might talk about a great holiday service or um what to do if you're in a restaurant or something you know um and so I I think that's the way I'll go as well to kind of so that people can again dip in and out of things that they think will be useful for them and if there's anybody who's listening who um sort of thinks you haven't covered this and I'd really like to know about this or I don't feel like my voice has been heard in something you know I'd love to hear about that because obviously it's a topic that can go on forever isn't it Definitely. And I think we could carry on chatting because, you know, if I'm in, if I'm having a chat with someone, I think, oh, that would be really good for Rosanna's podcast. And I can send them, do a little intro and send them your way. So Francis, Francis has said, it strikes me that there is a need for a new carefully choreographed public awareness campaign. So glad Rosanna and, and, and colleagues are now involved. Can you say a little bit more about Oranges and Oranges? I was going to ask that, Francis. Yeah, tell us a bit more about that play. What's it going to be? What's it going to be about? What's it going to be like? Thank you so much for asking. Um, I'm so excited about it. We're in a really good place with it. It's hard to write a play, I've, I've learned, um, but it's it's coming on leaps and bounds. So it's a two act stage play with a cast of seven so far. And it's set, Kate, uh, who is a guest on number five, her mum visited a weekly centre uh, called Sew and Grow. And uh, so our group is called Oranges and Lemons. And they go, and what they did a lot there, people with dementia was go out and plant um, flowers and vegetables and things. And then they would often chop them and cook them because actually, uh, motor skills, uh, muscle memory of chopping or planting and certainly smells that came out were really triggering memories and great conversation from people, um, you know, talking about stuff their mum used to cook and and things. Um, So that's our sort of main base is this lovely group. And within this group, we have people experiencing very different types of dementia. And we do follow a mother and daughter. There are sort of um, characters that take us through the play. But a lot of the brilliant plays and um, films, so much good stuff out there actually about dementia. They often focus on maybe one person who has dementia and that quite personal story through it. And what we want to show is lots of people and also how the people with dementia interact with each other. Because at this group, which you know I then went along to as well, they very kindly let me sit in and join in, um, is to show how actually we, we all thrive on having purpose. We really know that, don't we, of lockdown without having purpose at the moment at times. It's just ghastly, or it certainly was maybe this time last year. And that's something that comes up more I talk to people about dementia they want purpose and want things to do and it was lovely seeing people help each other because somebody might be really good at x but not very good at y and they would help each other and balance out so we've got lots of that in our plays we play we've got um this interaction of this group and at times it's very funny some dark humor at times but we wanted it to be warm and engaging because as Mandy says in her podcast you've got to laugh (laughs) you've really got to laugh Um, and my favorite type of theater is when you're laughing one minute and crying the next Um, so yeah we are on we've got a wonderful dramaturg involved at the moment who's worked at the Royal Court and the National and all sorts of things and she's um uh, taking us through to kind of one of the final drafts now and then hopefully when the world opens up again um, Soho Theatre in London are interested in it so we're in a good place. <laughs> wow that is exciting oh we've had some more questions come in. Uh, Joy said would be interested oh would be interested in Mr Alzheimer's adventures so Joy um, lives with um, Alzheimer's in Salford and she worked on a character called Mr Alzheimer's who um, she she developed to help her grandchildren understand more about how Alzheimer's affects her. So he has a happy side and he has a sad side. 
And Joy actually over the last three years has developed that up into a project. So she's been going into schools with Mr. Alzheimer's and um, there's a book, there's resources. So just to start a conversation in schools and, you know, the kids get a little bag with the book and the teddy bear, they take him home, they take him on an adventure, they write about it in the diary. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what Joy's been working on. So that's her comment there. Oh, Joy, that sounds fantastic. And, um, Maybe so every, everyone's going to end up on the podcast. No one's going to write anything now because they know I'm going to ask you to be on a podcast. That sounds fantastic. And I will look that up and maybe I could interview you about that. <laughs> Would be great. What a brilliant idea. Fab. Right. And then we've got a comment here. So one second. Oh, um, I brought up. Brought, oh, I, I was brought up to tell the truth. OK, so this person is talking about how difficult it is to tell a lie to somebody with dementia even though it's a white light and you know that that lie is not gonna is gonna protect them and not and not hurt them so his mom mom has alzheimer's and asked about father who had died back in 1964 and asked if he was coming to visit her um i wouldn't tell her he was dead Oh, i would tell her that she, he was dead she'd reel back in shock and become really upset i thought this Sorry, the, the spelling's just a little bit off, so I'm just struggling to see what it says. Um, I would truthfully tell her, it's not coming today. Oh, okay. I think initially this person might have said um, uh, that the per uh, that dad was dead and it wouldn't be coming in and then and then realised how, how much of an impact that had on mum and then moved over to saying that it wouldn't be coming in that day, but maybe they'll be coming in another day. And that's something for us in on empowered conversations and empowered care is it's something that comes up a lot we've given it a title of emotional truth um so just to help people because a lot of people struggle with a lie they don't want to lie to people but like you said you know if someone's asking for mummy looking beyond that and saying oh mum's maybe out shopping and maybe we could just hold hands and maybe you just need a little cuddle at the moment, just looking beyond the words to see what's going on. But yeah, we, we titled it Emotional Truth to help people when they do have to say a little white lie to protect a person. Rosanna, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story because yeah, of course you, you don't want to lie to someone. Also, it feels patronizing, I think, to lie to somebody and unfair, you know, you, you feel, especially when it's your parent, you know, you don't have the right to say that their husband or wife is alive when they're not. So it's really, it's really, really difficult. But it's really interesting that you say actually to spare that emotional realization every time um, is really interesting. And uh, Peter Berry, who I said has dementia, he has early onset Alzheimer's, and so he was so young when his Alzheimer's came on he was 50 that his dad was still alive in a home with dementia and he would go and visit his dad already knowing he had Alzheimer's and his dad um, kept thinking Peter was a little boy so he couldn't connect the Peter in front of him with being his son and at first Peter would try and explain it to him and he you know it, it distressed him he didn't understand he thought he was being tricked and so in the end Peter used to go and visit him and say um, I uh, oh, I'm, I'm just here to visit somebody else, but um, do you mind if I sit and chat to you for five minutes? And they could have a nice chat. Um, and then what was amazing, a few years later, Peter went cycling on his bike as he does around Suffolk with his friend Deb, who I, I talked about. He got to where the care home is that his dad was in, his dad now having died. And he said, oh, we should pop in and see dad, you know, and Deb said, maybe tomorrow, you know, and <laughs> it's it's really... It's really difficult and I think um, I think also it depends on the day doesn't it and I think it depends on the situation it depends on that moment and it's not it's not that you always do but you you pick and choose your time I suppose yeah there's there's never going to be a right answer is there there's never unfortunately and it's something that we talk about a lot is there's not a book with all the answers you don't just get a book and go here's all the answers if I just read this book and follow everything it says in that book then then that will be fine there isn't and you have to you have to be really be curious and think about what's going on why maybe why is maybe somebody saying something what what do they need is there an emotional thing there that they need they need a connection they may be feeling scared um but it is, it's one of our biggest, so um, 
we did I don't think you gave me a name it's anonymous um but it's one of our biggest challenges on 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 the course is just to work with carers around those what they feel is a lie and quite often we we talk about the tooth fairy we talk about father christmas so you know in in a sense we've been lying to our children um <laughs> if we think of it like that <laughs> we've gone to full lengths with the tooth fairy we've got <laughs> we've got an elf living in the house at the moment still <laughs> Brilliant. so yeah it's it's what you feel comfortable but but um but yeah it's very tricky very very tricky okay so thank you the, the play sounds amazing Rosanna it really really does sound fantastic um so Rosanna gave um a, a little sort of call to action for people if you do have any ideas and you think oh actually this would be a really good podcast um then then send those suggestions you can send them to me or you can put them in the comments now and let us know um or into our last couple of minutes so i just had um a question for you rosanna so obviously you've done you've done 10 of these podcasts and they're, they're half an hour but there's like a huge amount of work behind that half an hour and i'm just wondering about how you have been able to use that information and and those conversations you know when you're having a chat with your dad and, and your mum to sort of better support them both oh that's a great question um I actually early on in the podcast I wasn't um I felt a bit of a fraud actually because I wasn't really prepared still myself to be that open with my dad about it I think for him as well you know again he, he was sort of more um backing off from being open about it so I felt quite difficult because I was putting this stuff out there you know advocating this advice and not necessarily using it and I think sometimes you sort of slowly slowly catch your monkey with yourself um, about doing that I think my mum and I've always been really open with each other and talked about things but I think it was really useful to take her facts and 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 again just find ways into a conversation by saying oh I was talking to so and so and they said this and do you feel like that um was helpful, but certainly recently it's really changed. I um, I think actually it was because I was spending so much time editing these podcasts and my friends are so supportive going, we're really proud of you. And I thought, I haven't called my dad all week though. You know, and again, I was sort of questioning whether they should be proud of me. And, um, and I started sort of calling dad once a week, having really good conversations that were planned um, and, uh, bringing all this research with me and and I'm really sort of feeling that I'm in a more um, confident place because of all this to kind of know you can't always get it right but you can try um, and actually he listened to the first time for an interview I did on BBC Radio Suffolk on Friday and we spoke about you know his needs with dementia and that was wonderful and I feel so pleased that we've done that. Good. And, and I'm glad that this you can use this as a, an open and to have a chat with your dad and give him a place where he can go and talk about his dementia with you and what support he might need. Because quite often, yeah, we we're often thinking about the carer and, and maybe sometimes less so about the person with dementia that they, maybe they don't want to talk about the, their own diagnosis. Yeah, I I think that I think it's sometimes a bit like if you know someone who when when somebody's passed away, you often kind of don't bring it up with someone because you think oh, well I don't want to upset them they know they've remembered um and actually on oh going back I was about to say honesty is always the best policy but we've just discovered that's a great area but communication yeah it's brilliant. <laughs> thank you so much Rosanna I really really appreciate your time today and thank you for sharing the podcasts and I for one along with Francis and hopefully the other people who came along today will be listening to more of those um I think they're a fantastic resource um, so it just leaves me to say that we have um, another conversation with happening on the 31st of March and that's with Dr Maggie Ellis who's going to introduce us to adaptive interactions and that sort of research that she's been doing towards later stages and um, perhaps when somebody isn't um, verbal anymore and just thinking about how they can stay connected and how that they can still communicate with us. So that's on the 31st. There'll be an email that comes out to you all with a link for that, so don't worry. I'm gonna say thank you again, Rosanna. I'm gonna say thank you everyone for your comments, for attending. Um, please join us again and please go over. What I'll do, Rosanna, is I'll include the link um, to the podcast in the email that goes out tomorrow so that people, just in case they're not gonna go off now and do it, they'll go off and do it tomorrow. 
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Right. Thank <laughs> you so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.